Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jason. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. How are we? Good. Awesome. Six or seven of you. Good. Uh, while I'm here, first thing I always like to do, it's great to see you all. I'm so excited to be here this morning. I just want to shout out all the teachers, the staff, the volunteers, the sound guy, the music that we just heard. And you, can we just give a round of applause for everybody in the room? So, so grateful. And as Jason introduced me, he says, you know, special guest. And honestly, I just want to start with who am I? And so the only special attribute to me is that I've been saved by the grace and mercy of God. And so who am I? To start off, we're going to be on an equal playing ground. I am no better than anyone in this room. Spiritually, I've been forgiven. That's the big difference. So if you're a believer in here, you're my brother. You're my sister in Christ. And I don't want to make the assumption that everybody is. If you're not a believer, I was there. I was there in high school. I wasn't actively following Jesus at all in high school. And so my goal for today would be that if, if you're a Christian, if, if you believe that Jesus is Lord, my goal for today would be that you be encouraged. Glory to the Lord that he speaks through me to you to encourage, to uplift, or maybe even convict you a little bit. And if you're not a believer... My hope and my prayer would be that maybe God will open your eyes and ears a little bit more to the gospel. Maybe a seed will be planted today or will be watered today, all by the grace of God, all glory to the Lord. And so to make myself a little bit vulnerable, i got to be honest, I'm 34 years old, four kids, beautiful wife, but I definitely don't have it all figured out. So in no way do I want to be up here as the chapel speaker today with the mentality or for you to feel like, okay, this guy's got it. Because I, I don't. As a believer, 34 years old, I struggle every single day. In fact, I, here's what I know that you, and we're just going to get right into scripture if it's okay. Let the word speak for itself. Here's what I know. I know that in Romans 3.23, it says, for all have sinned, we all fall short to the glory of God. So I recognize that I'm a sinner. I understand that we're all sinners. We all fall short. The Bible also says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. So for the wages of our sin, we're all sinners, the wages, the debt that we owe is death. I know that. I also know that in the Bible in Romans 5, 8, it says, but God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Okay, so if we're all sinners and what we deserve is death, but God sends Jesus to die for us. Then I re keep reading in Romans 10, 9. It says, if you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart that Jesus is Lord and believe God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Okay. So I understand I'm a sinner. I recognize that I am. I understand that there's a debt that needs to be owed. But God steps in, sends Jesus to die for us. And if we confess and believe on that, we can be saved. And so I know Calvary does an incredible job. I have three kids already here going to school, and so I wouldn't want to send them anywhere else. This school, the staff, the teachers, just incredible people. And I know that they preach the gospel. So if you've heard this story, awesome. If you haven't, I'm sure you will. In the Old Testament, there's plagues that happen in Egypt. There's Moses and Pharaoh. This is the short version because I get long-winded and I, I recognize the time. And here's what happens. Towards one of the last plagues, a spirit gets sent out to kill the firstborn child. Does anybody know this story? A few people? Maybe? I saw it on Rugrats when I was little. That's how I first recognized it. So anyway, the spirit goes out and if any house had sacrificed lamb's blood above it, the spirit would pass by, okay? Meaning the firstborn wasn't killed in those houses. What I want to focus on is that the spirit didn't kill anyone who had the lamb's blood over the top. The spirit did not check inside the house to say, okay, who's worthy in here and who's not? It was the covering of the lamb's blood that saved them. And in the same way, the covering of Jesus' blood, the lamb, covers us. And so I get that now, 
That didn't, I couldn't recognize that in high school though. I struggled in high school with lust and so many different things. The biggest thing I struggled with though was not so much lust, it was there, lying, it was there, gossip, it was there. My biggest struggle when I was your age was I, I was a big fake. I just talked the talk, right? I spoke Christianese. I said all the right things. I saw when he raised his hand, I would raise my hand. I saw when she said amen, I would say amen. I knew what to say. I knew what to do. And I knew that I could be a fake to fake out my teachers. I could fake out my friends and family, etc. And then, so I was just lying every single day and putting on a show. And a quick story to, to kind of really emphasize this point is not too long ago, maybe four or five years ago, CBS has a television show called Big Brother. And Big Brother, long story short, I made it to the final round of interviews, meaning out of thousands of people, they narrowed it down to 25 people. I was one of those 25. Then they take like 16 to put on the show. So I'm very close. In fact, my wife and I started telling my family, we thought, hey, he's gonna be in LA, there, he's gonna be on Big Brother. Like, it's looking really good. My last interview, in every single interview, it was with LA producers and Hollywood and all these people on Skype recorded uh, video screen calls. My very last interview, the guy said, okay, this is it, this is your last one. Depending on how this goes, we'll put you on the show. Spoiler alert, I wasn't on the show, but listen. Here's what happened. During that interview, the guy said to me, he goes, Andrew, we don't know what to do with you. I kind of laughed and I always say, you know, I'm kind of like, the end of the loaf, I'm bread different. He laughed, I laughed, and we're just chopping it up. And he goes, we have a guy who's like you, married with kids, and it's between you and him at this point. He ended up making the show. But as I'm talking to him, he goes, the big, bro big brother's all about deceiving people, kind of manipulating people. How are you gonna be able to do that in a house? How are you gonna convince house guests that you can be their ally. How are you? Tell me how. Explain your strategy. I said, well, that's easy. Most of my life, I lied to my family and friends and strangers that I was a Christian. And I wasn't. And I faked all of them out for so many years. This show is going to be light work. This is going to be easy. And he said, wow. He said, you are just so honest. You are so, just so transparent. I said, but honestly, that's the truth. Then I took the moment that I had with all those producers sitting around the screen and I shared the gospel with them. And in my opinion, sharing the gospel with them is so much worth more than being on the show. I try to be like a big brother in that case. But the Christian walk is not easy. And so I, I really want to emphasize that walking this walk is not easy. It's, it gets difficult. And in fact, as I get older, and have more responsibility for kids, job, house, payments, furnace going out, all these different things. Life sometimes will present things to make you patient, to grow you in anger, to grow you in many different ways. And I didn't realize that. I always thought, and I, and I pray that this lands, I always thought when I was a certain age that there would be a point in my, my faith journey, I would get to that point and I'd be like, oh, I made it, this is easy now. No more Satan, I'm good. But that's not the case. That's not the case at all. And in fact, when I feel like I'm not being tempted or I'm not going through a struggle, I feel like I'm the furthest away from it. I almost feel like, what's going on here? Satan's not tempting me? Like, what? I must be somewhat wayward. And instead, when I am struggling, when I'm going through, whether it be a confrontation or a struggle or learning patience or learning anger or growing in lust or whatever maturity, that's when I'm closest to God. And so my hope and prayer is that if you do feel that conviction, that spiritual conviction inside of you, you know, okay, I feel this conviction. I know this is the spirit. This is wrong. I should not be in this. And I pray that is a moment that in some ways you rejoice that at least you have conviction. Because a lot of my friends, some of my family, sometimes I sit back and I think, how could they be doing that? Like, what's wrong with them? Why don't they see that? And it's just that they're blind. There's a verse out of Isaiah 43, verse 2 that I want to read. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. 
when you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. What I want you to notice in that verse is it says, when you pass through the waters, when you walk through the fire, the Christian life, trials, tribulation, it will come when it comes. He is with us. That's the consistent reminder. Not that we're a Christian, I got a great job, got a great car, X, Y, and Z. When we're a Christian, we're going to face trials and tribulations. Praise God that we have hope that he is here with us. And so speaking of hope, one thing that I want to encourage everybody in this room is in the Bible, the devil is also called the accuser, right? He's called the accuser. And what that means is he will accuse you of sins that you've done and try to remind you over and over again to make you feel bad or to make you feel like you're not good enough or to belittle you or to send you down a, a depressional state, if you will. Just keep reminding you of all the wrongs that you've done. He's the accuser. As believers, if there's one little encouragement I can give you, is if you have accountability, if you're connecting with someone and confessing your sins, James 5, 16 says, confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. If we're confessing, then when Satan reminds you of your past, you're like, yeah, I know. You're right. I'm a screw-up. You're right. I sin with that. Yeah, but I told Alex that Monday night, and he reminded me of the gospel. He reminded me how great God is. Yeah, Satan, you're right. I struggle in that area. But guess what? I told Tony that last Thursday. He knows he's praying for me. And so as much as he will accuse you, just remind him of his future. Remind yourself of the gospel. Constantly through scripture, we see Paul writing to Christians for a reason. We need to be reminded of the great gospel. And so several weeks ago, when Jason and I first connected and I started preparing for the sermon, at that time, I went to MSN, which is a website, and I just said, here's what I'm going to do for chapel. I'm going to go to this website. The very first 15 articles that pop up, I'm going to take their headliner, whatever the headline of the article name is, I'm going to write it down, and we're going to see how the world's doing it. Okay? So this is several weeks back. I did not alter any of these. These were the top 15 around the world articles. Number one, classified documents discovered at Mike Pence's home in Indiana. Politics. Woman sexually assaulted in psychiatric ward at Trinity Health Lavina Hospital. Sexual assault, psychiatric ward, mental health. Will Kentucky make March Madness? After last night, doesn't look good. 2023 NFL tickets and schedule. 2023, so already next season. This was before the Bengals took it out. So they're already looking for the future. Three shop dead at convenience store. Suspect in standoff with SWAT team. Death. North Carolina parents charged with murdering adopted four-year-old son by duct taping him to the floor. Four arrested over sexual assault and subsequent death of LSU student. NFL world reacts to Tom Brady's announcement on Monday. Biden document discovery doesn't add up. NC State head coach Kevin Yates calls leaky blacks foul on Taquarion Smith a basketball play. So this was a, a foul play that happened and everyone on social media just kept talking about it. The top 10 sexiest new TV shows we'll be sweating over in 2023. What? Woman explains what happens when, now I got your attention. Woman explains <laughs> what happens when you have piercings and go to prison. <laughs> University of Cincinnati warning the loss of a student and Paul's credit card interest payments until nearly 2025. We heard credit, finances, we heard debt, we heard sexual assault, we heard sports, which could be idolized to many of us. For me, it was a, a long idol for my life. I idolized Kentucky basketball. In fact, I worked with Kentucky sports. And I worked with John Calipari, and I was at a peak moment in my life where I thought, this is amazing, this is, it can't get any better, but I still want it more. That's why we just sung that, not sung that nothing is more than Jesus. We will feel empty in our idols. But when we hear those, the world's not doing that good, right? We live in a very broken world. And I don't know if you know this, this month we have a movie coming out called Cocaine Bear. Okay? And so, listen, 
no, 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 no. Here's the problem. It, it's probably going to make a lot of money. It's rated R. But isn't that something that that's, that's like, that's the movie coming out this month that people are talking about? A bear who does cooking? Like, this world is broken. And it's very clear that we need a Savior. We need a Savior. And so, what I grew up in was, I grew up in a, a Catholic religion and faith system. But I was a server boy, so I would serve three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So, like, we have chapel, we had mass. And so every morning I would serve for about a 45 to 55 minute uh, mass. And then on the weekends, I would either serve Saturday or Sunday, or do a wedding or funeral throughout the week. And so most of the time, I was in church four to five days a week. Okay, so I heard a lot about faith and religion. But one big takeaway that I want to share with you, and maybe you've heard this before, is through that system that I was in, there were tall stained glass windows, beautiful windows at this Catholic church. And these stained glass windows are nothing but broken pieces of glass that are colorful, glued together. And with that stained glass window there, every single morning I saw it, the sun would shine through on the right side of the building, and it was beautiful when it was sunny out. And in the same way, when we look at the world, and we look at ourselves, I feel as though we are nothing but broken pieces of glass. And when God puts together us, Jesus, his son, can shine through. And it's a beautiful thing. So don't forget that. This world's broken, we're broken. But we have hope in Christ. So what do we do? Well, I'd be a fool not to address what I believe is causing many to either walk away from the faith, go towards a depressional route, maybe anger, especially lust. But if we serve a God who knows each of the hairs on our head and knows the stars in the sky, why do we not think that he doesn't know what's on our phones? Or, or why do we not think that he doesn't know what we do alone? Right? It's so easy, whether it be TikTok, Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, you name the app. How much time do we consume on these? Are they a distraction? Do you spend more time on your phone than you do with the Lord? I assume the screen time on your phone, if, if you have a... Apple, if you have an Android, I'm not sure what that is. But on an Apple, the screen time, I'm assuming it's not just with the Bible app. Right? How much time are you spending on these things? But understand, I'm no better. I was always looking. For me, it took about until several months ago that I had to remove all social media apps off of my phone. Okay? Also, and when I covered UK, understand, this was very difficult for me. But when I covered UK sports... I grew a decent following, thousands of followers on Twitter, thousands on TikTok. So for me, it was hard to delete these apps, but I realized it was an idol, it was, I realized it was an investment, I was making too much time, and most of the time, it was unhealthy, right? Because TikTok, you're just scrolling and scrolling, you're like, an hour and a half has gone by, scrolling and scrolling. And so I, for me, this was my justification. I might scroll through a few reels or scroll through a few videos that might have had indecency, right? Whether it be girls, but oh, scroll through it. I'm just looking for a, a dope Christian sermon jam or, or, or a great Christian music in the background, convicting message to re-energize me or excite me. And so I would negate the 40 minutes that I, I spent on garbage and fill just to look for that one video. And then when I would get it, I'd be on a high. But guess what? Those highs? Or temporary. If, if that's what you're looking for, which is that's what I would do sometimes, I'd realize that eventually I'd be right back in the wormhole, going down an unhealthy path. And so Hebrews 13, 8, instead of those temporary highs, Hebrews 13, 8 says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the only constant. And so I want to remind you guys to consistently focus on him. And I used to sing this uh, song. Thank you. Shout out to that. I didn't even tell him to put that up there. Shout out to you. Uh, so I used to sing this little song. It says, and, and again, I was in choir, and we had a little chant to it. I'm not going to do the whole chant. But we used to do, oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For your father up and above is looking down with love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Here's the reality. 
and it, it would get clapped sometimes. Here's the reality. That's out of Mark 4.24, where it says, pay attention to what you hear. It will be measured upon you. And then in the Bible it says, take every thought captive. So what, you're very good. You're very good back there. Um, what, what happens is when we don't take every thought captive and we're constantly being exposed to this, it can come out of us in many different ways, whether you realize it or not. And so I had to get offline to get online with Christ. And so let me ask you this question. Do people know you're a Christian because of your actions? Or do people think you're a Christian because you're acting? I'll ask again. Do people know you're a Christian because of your actions? Or do people think you're a Christian because you're acting? And of course I'm not saying it's a sin to be on social media. Of course not. I still am. But I'm intentional about it. Now I have to go to a computer in order to tweet or do something. But if you are on social media and are using apps, some of these things that can be a distraction, I pray that you're doing it in a way that glorifies the Lord. Right? 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do for the glory of God. So no matter what we're doing, sports, athletic, whatever, on app, do for the glory of God. That's what the Bible commands us to do. So often, I feel like what at least troubled me is fears, the unknown, right? Not knowing what's going to happen. So oftentimes... That would hinder my faith walk. We're going to try something. I don't know how this is going to go. But I need four volunteers. Can I have four hands? No. All right, right here. <laughs> Guy in the back. Two more. Gentlemen over there. And then Miss. But yeah, right. But yeah, you, you, you. Up. Yep, you. Come on up here. Come on up here. Yep, come on up. Four volunteers. Four volunteers. <laughs> okay. Jason, I hope this is okay. Um, Here's what we're going to do. Jason is breaking the rules. All right, I saw your hand first, okay? So you come over here. I'm going to blindfold my friend here, okay? What's your name? Carson. Carson. Everyone say hi, Carson. Hi, Carson. So hi, you come over here, sir, on this side. And what are what are your names? Everyone say hi, Jack. Hi, Jack. Olivia? Say hi, Olivia. Hi, hi Olivia. Okay. <laughs> Aiden. Everyone say hi, Aiden. What's up, Aiden? Aiden. Okay. So I'm going to blindfold my friend here, and I'm going to have you stand over on this side somewhere. Then I may or may not strategically place your friends along the path walking to me, okay? But listen, you've got to listen to me. I'm going to guide you blindfolded. If you listen to me, you're going to get here, all right, okay? But listen to me. What I need everybody else to do simultaneously is as I'm talking to him, feel free to try to distract him, okay? Feel free, don't, don't make it where the preschool can hear you, but feel free to try to distract him while I got him. Now you need to listen to my voice, okay? So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna try this blindfold on you. Sorry, is that good? Is that too tight? Can you see? How many fingers am I holding? How many fingers am I holding? Okay, he can't see. He set four there. Okay, so here I'm going to guide you from this way. All right, so here's where I'm going to place you. All right, we're going to place you about right here, okay? Now I'm going to turn you around. Don't look up, right? Just look straight, okay? I want you to keep okay? You good? Okay, great. Now I'm going to strategically place your friends, okay? All right. Now, what I want... What I want you to do, sir, is come right here. All right, I'm going to place you about right here. Okay, Miss Olivia, right? Yep, okay, awesome. Olivia, let's go ahead and place you about right here. And, oh yeah, good spot. Good, good idea. Yeah, let's go ahead and place you here. Okay, now I'm going to guide our friend to me and safely. Now just be careful. If you need to stick out your hands, make sure you don't hit anyone, but just listen to me, okay? You got it? All right, crowd, feel free to distract him. Okay, ready? Take one step up. One step up. Thank <laughs> you.
Give it up for our volunteers. <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is yes, standing up. The point I'm trying to make is this. Often in life, we worry. We're going into certain situations with our eyes blindfolded or closed, and we may not see what's in front of us. And we actually might worry about things that may not even happen. Obstacles that may not even come in our way. But either we listen to the world or we understand how life works. And so we think we're going to bump into them. But if we listen to the Lord and we listen to his word and he guides, despite distractions all around us happening, he's going to get us there safely. So give a round for you guys. Thank you for Okay. So... You may have heard this story, maybe you haven't. It's an old tale. And in fact, the other night when I did research about this, I looked up. Have you ever heard the story about how Eskimos would take care of their wolf problem? If you, if you haven't and you look it up, a researcher actu actually interviewed different Alaskan tribes to see if this tale was even true. Now come to find out, after he interviewed these different tribe members, they said, we never heard of it, but we're not saying it's not true. Regardless, just listen to how it applies. So wolves will come around Alaska, eat different things. Oh, this is a sped up version. Alaska tribe members didn't like that. So in order to prevent the wolf from taking out whether it be their flock or whatever it is, what they would do is they would take a blade or a knife and they would put blood on it. They put blood on the knife. They would then let it freeze. Then... They would put more blood on it, let it freeze, more blood, let it freeze. Essentially, they'd set it out where the wolves were around that area, where they saw the wolves uh, rummaging. Then the wolf would smell the freshly scented blood. So he would come up and he would lick that coated frozen blade. Well, what's happening is as he's licking it, the ice is dissolving. And all of a sudden, he's getting down more blood, more blood. Now he's tasting warm blood his own blood. He's licked it so much that it's gone through the ice, and now he's just licking his blood to death. And so the reality is, is sin will literally kill you if we're not careful. And as you go down this wormhole, and you go down these rabbit holes of different things, if you're not careful, I promise you, you can end up in a situation where you never thought you would be never would even imagine that you would be there. And so I encourage you guys, don't be like the wolf at all. Now, read your Bible. I, I can't reiterate that enough. Read the Bible for yourselves. It's great that, that this school is this school and we can sing songs with scripture in it and that we go to chapel and we have our Bibles that we're constantly around. But I pray and I encourage you guys to read the Bible for yourself. John Piper was once asked, he's an incredible pastor, check him out on YouTube for any of his clips are incredible. He was once asked, this girl said, hey, I'm about to go on missions for three years. I just need one piece of advice. What would it be? And here's what he said. Know your Bible. Know your Bible. Know your Bible. That's what his advice was. And so in the same way, I pray that you would know your Bible. So a question that I want to ask you, in, in no raise of hands here to make it awkward, but a question I want to ask is, do you believe that your prayers can actually be answered? Amen. Now, I'm going to ask it again, and, and just think about it. Do you believe your prayers can be answered? Because I feel like if we actually believe that our prayers could be answered sometimes, we would pray a lot more. And maybe it's not so much praying for an A on a test or something like that. But in general, do you believe your prayers can be answered? Because let me tell you, as a father, my kids, I love when they interact and talk with me.
some days are somewhat of a struggle for me when they run right by. I'm like, hey, hey, buddy, run right by. Don't even talk to me. And so I wonder if our Heavenly Father feels that all the same way when we just, we got what we need, we just run right by. Read your Bible and pray. There's a story in the book of John, John 4, a woman at the well. You may have heard this. I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. There's a Samaritan woman at a well. Okay, she's getting water. She's thirsty. Jesus is a Jew. He meets her at the well. Okay? Now, one thing you need to know is Jews and Samaritans don't associate. So the fact that he even went and talked to her was taboo. You don't do that. Anyway, he talks to her and he says, Look, I know you're thirsty. If you come to me, you will never thirst again. Now, she had five husbands and another man at the time. Here's the thing. Jesus told her that. She didn't tell him that. He told her that. And so she goes, oh, are you a prophet? She's wondering. And then eventually it gets to the point where he said, she goes, are you the Messiah? And he goes, yeah, I am he. Then, at that time, the Bible says, so after he's told her things about her, she leaves the water, the jar that she, the, the purpose of her being at the well, she leaves it to go tell her town. A few things I want to know. She didn't pursue Jesus. Jesus pursued her. So whatever, whatever you're in right now, whatever well you're trying to get thirst from that's just empty and empty and empty, understand that Jesus can meet you there. Okay? Number two, if we drink from the living water just like we sung about, he is enough. I mean, Psalm 23, 1. I just did a little diva with my kids the other night. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He is all that we need. But here's the thing. Just like she did when she encountered Jesus, she left the jar of water and went and told everybody. And so when you encounter Jesus, you can leave these empty things because you understand they're never going to fully satisfy and you're going to want to tell everyone. Now, back in the day, there used to be a YouTuber, he still may exist, I don't know, it's called The Amazing Atheist. Now, back in the day, I used to be more of a prevalent YouTuber in the sense of before my channel got banned, I was selling merch. This is like 15 years ago. Had my own website, a lot of fun stuff. And oftentimes, I would post scripture and different references. And people would look at The Amazing Atheist videos, and they would come comment on my videos, and then my followers were commenting on his, and eventually, we were just kind of going back and, back and forth messaging. Well, one time, and he was an atheist, and he would proclaim it. I was a believer, and I would just share gospel videos sometimes. So, anyway, he goes to a concert one night. And it's been years since I heard the story, but this is the gist. He goes to a concert one night, and outside the concert, there's Christians there. And they're sharing the gospel. And most of them have little Bible tracts that they're handing people. But they're doing it in love. And he made an emphasis about that. That something was different about these Christians, because they weren't condemning or yelling. They were doing things in love. And so anyway, one of the Christians that were there that walks up to him, doesn't know who he is, obviously. He's going to this concert. The Christian happened to be there. Hands him a track and says, looks him dead in the eye and says, how can I pray for you? Is there anything I can pray for you about? The amazing atheist said that he said no and just kind of walked. He goes, but the look that that guy had in his eyes about he really cared for him and his soul to try to witness to him. It, it made the atheist, amazing atheist, speechless. And so sometimes the question is, I, I ask us, is he says, this is what the amazing atheist said on his YouTube video that was getting millions of views, mind you, is he says, and this is an atheist saying this, how much do you have to hate someone not to share the gospel with them if you're a Christian? Like, if, if we believe that there's a heaven and hell, and we believe that there's a kingdom, and you can be with Jesus, and then there's not, and you care about the people around you, how much do you have to hate them not to tell them about this living water that we will never thirst again? And in fact, one day, uh, I went on this mission trip. It was called Ilmfuge. And so my church would go on it every single summer, this sped-up version. Mission Fuge was eight weeks out of the summer. You would go to usually a Christian university, college campus, when you were in high school, and what you would do is you would go one out of those eight weeks, and different churches from all around the country would come. So you would go one week, and maybe 50 other churches would go that same week. So you were there with hundreds of other high school kids. 
And we were staying at a, a college in Charleston, South Carolina, and while we were there, this is what you would do. You would have little missions. So maybe your mission group was to go paint a fence. Maybe your mission group was to go play at a park with kids. Maybe your mission group was to put uh, roof shingles on a roof. Regardless, you were out six hours of the day doing mission type work. And I gotta admit, I went for the wrong reasons. I went for lust, I went for girls, I went for just fun environment. I went for the wrong reasons, but I knew why we were there. We were there not only to love and do these great things, but also share about Jesus. Now, when you would get done with your mission work for the day, you would go back to the college university, and each church would be called in to eat dinner. While you, at, while you ate dinner, there was a college campus, right? So you had a salad bar, a pizza bar, a taco bar, amazing, great food. I love pizza. So I went to the pizza bar every single day. And what I noticed, we're going to give her the name Anita. Anita was always putting out pizzas, taking the old trays, putting on new ones. My church was one of the last ones called. And so while we were finishing up dinner, I would see Anita and all the other workers come out and start cleaning off their area. Salad bar, taco bar, pizza bar, etc. They'd clean it off. Now, I knew while we were there towards the end of the week, I just felt something inside me. Take your tray up, give it to Anita, and just talk to her. Took my tray up, started talking to Anita. I said, Anita, how long have you been doing this? Right? She said, oh, I've been doing this about a, a dozen years. I said, awesome. I said, do you always do this in Elm Huge during the summer? She goes, oh, yeah, I do. I've been doing it for as long as they've been doing it, which is a little over a decade. I said, wow, that's incredible. I said, Anita, I have to ask you this question. I was like, I just feel called to ask you this. You do this eight weeks out of the summer? She said, yes, sir. I said, do you do it for the university as well? Remind, remember, Christian University. She said, oh, yeah, I'm here. I'm here basically all year long. I get about a month off. I said, wow. I said, in your eight weeks during the summer, while students are there on mission trip, and then throughout the school year, as it's a college Christian university, how many, how many people have shared the gospel with you? She said, none. I was like, eight weeks every summer, no one shared it with you. She said, no. I said, do you mind if I share it with you? She said, sure, I know it, though. I said, okay. So we laughed, we talked, and we prayed. But... What convicted me the most is how often do I think, okay, my mission field is the roof, or my mission field is the park, or my mission field is this, and we pass by the people that we see and interact with every day and either assume someone else is going to talk to them or maybe our fears or worries or whatever is not leading us to talk to them. And so it was just a conviction for me. And so I want to say this. Let everything you do lead others to the cross. John 10.10 10 is very clear. It says the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but you can have life and life more abundantly in Jesus. And so I pray that you have life to the full. And in Philippians 4.8, it says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, talk about such things. Think about such things. So what are we thinking and talking about and I'll end it with this. I like to incorporate uh, raps, if it's okay, in my, uh, in my talks. Some grew up with Fruit Loops. I grew up with Fruit Rings. Others grew up with Apple Jacks. Sometimes my cereal box said Apple Things. What I'm trying to say is I can spot the difference from someone who grew up with Google Search Versus someone like me who grew up with Yahoo and Bing. Now I'm going to air out my dirty laundry. Make it clean. Parents raised me right. You don't go outside until you eat every last baked bean. When the window AC got, got turned on, Annie, go close all the windows and shut each screen. I understand now. Money didn't grow on trees. We just didn't have the green. Dad, I hurt my chest. Ah, I rubbed some mud on it. No, Dad, I think I broke my spleen. We didn't always have brain cola. We had big K soft drinks, still had caffeine, and the majority of the clothes I wore were hanging down from Jean. Come to think about it. <laughs> Including this pair of Jean. Don't talk while others are speaking. Mr. Bean, often banquet with frozen dinners. Never link with Zine. Both my parents were a working machine. Growing up, never had a TV that was a flat screen. Instead, we played outside with the evergreen. Stocked up on candy when I go out on Halloween, but I'm thankful learning about the man with spikes in his hands behind me talking about Wolverine. So what do I know about struggle? What you know about being in a reading band during recess while their kids are playing football and you're learning that you're a muggle? Jokes aside though, I've had my highs and lows, I must say. Let's start with the highs. I got to hang out with Grammy Award winner Lecrae for a day, met Billboard number one artist NF on my 30th birthday, and was in Coach Calipari's house with the Wildcats for a selection Sunday. 
But now let's look at the lows. My grandma had a heart attack at midnight during my cousin's wedding reception. My friend was hit and passed in a driving accident while looking for a reception. And I lost my girlfriend to a drunk driver in college, so don't get a misconception. I understand, though, I don't know a thing about racial or social injustice. All I know is that I'm social and just his. So I go to poetry slams to learn about hardships I know nothing about. And I'm here to share about the living water, Jesus. Because with him, you'll never have a drought. I respect every poet that takes a stage for what they believe. I said stage four, because when it comes to healing, Jesus can, sir. You just got to receive. My friend said, Bishop, people are saying some awfully mean things about you. I said, oh yeah, like what? He said they're calling you a liar, deceitful, a hypocrite, but that you covered up because you don't curse. I said, is that all? He said, well, yeah, but it's because they don't know you. I said, you're right, because if they knew me, they would have said worse. I need Jesus more than anyone I know. Because I'm MC, try to put on a show, follow his script. I said, AMC, put on a show, follow script. In other words, I'm good at playing acts. Well, I should be reading the book of Acts. It's like I'm putting makeup on a pig, spray an axe. Chisel me, Lord, go on and use an axe. But for real, I don't do it for the crowd cheer. In fact, I need Jesus so much. I might pray and crouch here, and I never after a bag of 300. I'm here to tell you I go to war with my flesh like the movie 300. So at the end of this poem, understand one thing. I'm a sinner, saved by grace, trying to love God, love people, and serve our King. Thank you so much. I love you Amen. all.